Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, why whales, wherever in the world you are today. Uh, today is February 2nd. Uh, Bitcoin is at 23,800 and, and kind of, you know, just settling there. Yesterday, uh, the Fed came out. We went up by 25 basis points. Um, and the market really didn't react majorly. I think everyone anticipated that. So it, it's been relatively calm in uh, the cryptocurrency as well as the traditional finance markets. Um, I say that after a horrendous uh, Q4 and uh, really a, a bad start to Q1. The reason I bring that up, um, and as we kind of roll into our, our conversation today with Holly, uh, is that none of this has caused a crypto winter, per se. Uh, we're clearly in a bear. Um, I think we, we're seeing a little bit of the signs of life that we'd like to see, uh, just to kind of go from there. Uh, but a winter means that no one has any interest, uh, that, that companies have kind of shunned it, uh, investors are, are entirely ignoring the entire asset class, and that can last for, for years. Um, we saw clearly that the market turned from bull to bear uh, last last year in 22, and now we're kind of seeing the, the life's, uh, life signs of, of the market reemerging, but the innovation never stops. Um, and, and one of the things that's so exciting about you know talking with Ali today from Palm uh, NFT is really how busy you guys have been. Um, you know how many how much interest there is in the technology even after seeing kind of the, 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 the bubble burst on essentially some of the NFT platforms, um, it really showcased that you have to have something more than just a cartoon, <laughs> you know, JPEG up there. Um, and there is a ton of value and there's a lot of people interested in that. Um, but before we kind of dive into all uh, my random theses and, and ramblings, um, Ali, let's kind of go back a little bit and, and introduce yourself to the audience so they understand, you know, kind of how it, your journey got you um, into full-time uh, NFT creation from a from an op, almost uh, a much larger scale than most. Sure, and great to be here. Thanks for having me on, Jay, and and thanks to all the Y Whales I've connected with so far. You guys are an awesome organization, and it's exactly what the space needs is is things like Y Whales. So I'm pleased to be part of it. Um, I spent a lot of years, over a decade at American Express, a lot of years in payments and started working more in innovation tech of payments in about 2013 and that was tap to pay so this is not the first technology i've been involved in that was perhaps before consumer demand so you think i learned my lesson but uh you know pe we were paying people then a dollar each time they would tap to pay whereas now you know everyone's doing it on their phone as they go into subways or go into a quick service restaurants wherever it will be um after spending some time in that innovation team I decided that I did want to be more involved in tech than I had in the past. I spent most of my time at Amex in, in sales and partnerships. And I actually left and started working for a tech services company and helped help set it up. And we built tech for the payments industry. So we would go to the likes of Visa and MasterCard and find out where they were being too slow themselves on building tech and help them build it. And it got me a lot deeper into, into that space. Um, we grew a company from one dev team of six to up to 85 people in, in two and a half years. A lot of fun, exhausting in the services business. Learned a lot and actually spent most of my time there shunning anything to do with blockchain because we'd be dealing with innovation groups and they'd say, I'd like you to build me something on the blockchain. And I'd say, what, why, or what do you need? And, you know, it was ticking boxes. And I was such a skeptic then of the space um, because of that. And this was kind of 2018 type mm -hmm. time where a lot of people are now associated with were pretty deep in, in the space. So it didn't fit what I was selling and didn't fit what I thought people really needed and seemed like a luxury item. Um, I then left that organization and, and set up for uh, an Italian tech company on the New York Stock Exchange. I set up an innovation lab for them. Um, they were in the uh, mobile communication space. And whilst I had set up this innovation lab and, you know, thought I was being involved in innovation, I sort of turned around and looked at the tech and it's really text message marketing. And it didn't mm -hmm. feel the most innovative thing, innovative thing that could be out there. So I started spending a lot more time trying to figure out what was. If I'm truly positioning myself as like an innovator, what can I do other than, you know, two-factor authentication or getting people to sign up to subscribe to, to text messages? So um, that's when I started looking at NFTs. And my, my first interest was through Nifty Gateway, different things that were going on. I don't have that day trade mentality mindset. So I was never going to win at that flipping NFT game. But I did really 
find it interesting, the constructs of the contracts behind what you could be signing up for. And this was as we were kind of go in the midst of COVID. Mm-hmm. And um, I was associated with a few music venues across New York and thinking about how they would survive and, and what they could do in their space and, and started toying with the ideas with a few of them around, um, you know, what if you were giving out NFTs for people that were now turning up to live culture again after mm-hmm. the pandemic and what could their long-term value be of that? Almost all these music venues had some sort of story they would regale where, you know, in the nineties they had Oasis play there in front of 112 people and, you know, almost all have been involved in the, the meteoric success of someone's career. Mm-hmm. So could this new tech actually start being beneficial to them so they'd have more than just bragging rights in the future? And could there be some sort of financial implication that, that rewarded them for supporting small artists? So through that path, I, I came across the guys at Palm, um, actually randomly on a, a sort of movie NFT project that, that never saw the light of day, but was working through the Warner team and working through Palm and met Dan and Matt, two of the founders. And um, after six months of sort of investigating this more, contacted them to say, you guys have any jobs going? Because I think I want to jump into this full time. And um, I really like the path you were on. They'd already then launched a project with Damien Hurst that launched that the, the Palm launched with. It was our first project. And was signed to do things with nifties.com on, uh, on on some movie IP and I really wanted in loved conversations I'd had with them. So that's sort of how I ended up at Palm um, just after they finished their, their uh, funding round last December. So I joined beginning of December. So I've been there just, you know, about 14 months. That's awesome. That's awesome. So let's, let's take a, I want to take a quick second and jump back to a little bit of your work history. Cause I think it's always very important. Uh, and I talk quite a bit about people's 10,000 hours and, and, you know, you've got some, some touch bases and, and some, uh, you know, emerging asset classes. And so something like, you know, touch to pay where you just have the phone and you tap and whatnot. Um, still, still like lifetime is begging me to, to convert over to the touch, you know, tap to enter versus scanning the little, uh, barcode, yeah. uh, in the Apple wallet. And so it is, it is a tough, you know, you have to change consumer habits um, and you have to, to convince consumers as well that, that, it, that even though it's only going to take 90 seconds for me to fix this thing on my phone, that that's, a wor- that's worthwhile yeah. for, for a variety of reasons. So you end up with these very long um, implementation processes, as you very well know, that the technology works perfectly yep. and then it becomes and then it goes from technology to education. And I think that that's really the phase that that we're we're not fully in yet um, for for NFTs. I think the technology still got a little ways to go. I mean, it's still refining consistently, but the education is is desperately needed because uh, most people have no idea what they're doing. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, there comes a point as well with what what do people need to know, right, in order for them to enjoy that experience and that activity and actually like derive some sort of perceived value from it. So I don't really know how a QR code might open up a web page on my phone. Do I need to know? But it's a very easy thing for me to do and gain new information when I'm on the fly, right? So I, I really enjoy this challenge, exactly what you're saying. And, you know, learning from tap to pay days and, you know, we're not giving people a dollar every time they mint an NFT. Like a vending machine for tapping the but pay. you could you could you theoretically yeah, so you could. could you you probably go through some cash pretty quick as we found out and you know human behavior always throws up surprises and one of the things we tell our clients at palm is of all the kpis you should have in place for any of these drops making sure you learn things you didn't expect to happen is a really good one and if you launched a program and everything happened that you expected perhaps you didn't push the boundaries enough Mm-hmm. Perhaps you didn't, you know, um, you, perhaps you did, you, you launched too late because you waited till you knew too much information. I don't know. There's lots of different ways, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily see that as a, as a plus if someone didn't learn anything that they weren't expecting to, to find out. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I think you also said a really interesting point about a piece of technology, you know, QR codes. <laughs> They've been around for a long, long time. I mean, I remember back in the mid uh, 2010s, you know, 
looking at starting a company that, that was really going to focus on QR codes and implementing these because it just makes so much sense that every camera could use them. So the technology was there. The use case was, was relatively you know, popular, but it never, it just, nothing ever, there was no adoption. And then yeah. COVID hit and suddenly became like menus and, and a lot of things needed to go away. And it's like, people just wanted to use their own device. And now QR codes are, are prevalent and, and every single phone accepts them. Everyone understands when they see them, what to do. And, and it's going to happen that, you know, some, something similar here, because there's going to be that use case for NFTs that's going to entirely just say it is going to push global adoption. And so I'd love to kind of, you know, pivot over and, and, and really understand what you guys over at Palm NFT, NFT Studio are doing to kind of really test in those boundaries and limits of consumer adoption for yeah. corporations, which is where you guys focus, correct? Yeah, it is. It is. That's a good point. I always like to state, you know, either sports stars that were around when tech came out or, you know, events that took place or music that was playing, you know, when the QR code, which is probably even like 2002 or something before it. Oh, yeah. You know, and people are going to be now saying, you know, the World Cup was in Qatar when NFTs first came out and uh, or, you know, first hit the mainstream. And, you know, that's that's going to be some narrative somewhere in the future for someone that probably isn't you and me. Yeah. Um, I think where we're focused on as well as that sort of learning is definitely like fan centricity and longer term plays um, and li listening to the fans. And, and that gives, pulls up a lot of challenges for companies that we're, we're targeting. And the companies we're targeting and speaking to in general have um, appointed ahead of Web3 or Metaverse or NFTs. They're typically a Fortune 1000 type-ish size consumer facing brand. And they're now trying to maximize the return on the investment that they've made in, in that team and what can they learn and where can they get to in that space. So that's sort of who we're talking to. Um, the challenges and things we're trying to solve is how do you pivot from a product launch and make decisions within days, like organizations like Porsche were asked to do last week, huge organization made a decision which some people think are very easy to just stop your mint and carry on from here like organizations and especially in automotive space are not used to after a product launch having to make a few a decision in a matter of days not mm -hmm. even months so there's some really interesting challenges to get through teams there and also voice of the customer and where your fans sit and just new ways of segmenting segmenting those fans you know we work a lot with dc comics you could be a fan of comics or of movies or just of Batman or just of Harley Quinn or different areas. And how you've been talked to in the past was probably what one projection based on just that star. Um, and, you know, there's lots of different combinations that we can do now and start looking at if you did use a QR code to mint an NFT when you're at a Batman premiere, what is your behavior like now around the comics that we put out? How many uh, storylines do you vote on, which you're entitled to, to help shape new comics of the future? Um, and marrying all those things together, you know, it, it takes time with some of these brands and, and not trying to teach them everything at once. But, you know, we, we like the idea of going on these journeys and small challenges of, of learning along the way and incremental. I'm hoping that brands in that space I mentioned use 2023 to continue to do some proof of concepts, but tie those together rather than something over here on flow, something on ETH, different parts of the organization, not talking. How do you start to put these together? Because fans are starting to notice now. Yeah. And I think you bring up a really interesting point that I, I have to, you know, have that same battle consistently, which is, there's a larger strategy, <clears throat> you know, these are, you know, NFT and NFT is, is not, you know, the same in, on every chain. It's not the same for every company and it's not the same for every person that deploys it. You know, it, as you well know, you could probably yell down the hallway and somebody could deploy a new NFT project within the next 10 minutes, new contract, spin it up, throw it out there. What have you created? That, nothing. Um, you've created something that lives on chain. It's everything that happens afterwards. Yep. You know, to, to me that the, an NFT or digital collectible, whatever we're going to call them for, <laughs> for the next few months, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a key. It opens access to something 
Some of them have access to nothing. Some of them have access to communities or to utility or to uh, you know financial products, whatever the case is. And so the the concepts that I really love about the NFT worlds, and we've done so many drops and we've done so much work on. You know, we've, we've tested out almost every chain we can mm -hmm. just to just yeah. to try it, um, knowing that these are not long term. So like I've, we've never done a drop and, and stated, hey, you know, these are these are going to be the greatest things and they're going to be worth, you know, what the board apes or crypto punks are. No, we're just saying, hey, this is we're a community. Let's try it. And let's and let's educate our community on Ethereum. Let's educate on Solana. Let's educate on yep. Polygon and let's continue to go around and really figure out what works best. And I think that exactly what you said, that's such the right way to do it today. Um, because when it, full consumer adoption ramps up and there is that, that, that use case that it's like, you can't do this anywhere else, but with a digital collectible or NFT, that's where people are going to be caught flat footed. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And you know, you can learn a lot without launching, uh, a project as well with some of these brands. I feel like 2022 for a lot that we're speaking to was, was the year for that. You know, I, we, we're not in general. We're, we're speaking with companies or working with companies that have already appointed that sort of made that move to someone who is head of Web3. Mm -hmm. If organizations haven't, it's a, good, it's a good time to do it. There's a lot of smart people in the marketplace at the moment looking for roles. And um, there's, there's a, some talent that could probably help you figure out that space. But there were too many, I'd say 18 months ago, there were too many people in these organizations talking about Web3, but didn't have a MetaMask, weren't doing minting. We spent a lot of time last year doing almost like minting happy hours with clients, right? And getting them to use tools. Because otherwise you're talking about this. I know, I can tell from talking to you, you don't have a crypto wallet, at least <laughs> not one that you've got seed phrases for. So let's change that, but let's try and do that in a safe environment, like positive environment. Um, Web3 does have a propensity to sort of like snicker at other things going on. You know, we have anecdotal stories that like you hear of lawyers asking to review every smart contract before it goes out because it's a contract, right? And they should be approving it or redlining it. There's just a level of knowledge there, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's frustrating for the person who's head of Web3 at that company that's being asked these things, but it's not uncommon. And how can we help them with that rather than sort of like point fingers at that legal team and say, you guys don't know what you're talking about. You don't understand blockchain. Well, that's fine. Then that's not really an important part of their role when they got their job. So, you know, we're trying to partner as closely with these organizations as possible. And I and I love that. And and to me, the you know why whales you know original theses is education. <clears throat> and so any other organization like like Palm that you guys are really focused on, look, we can deploy the technology. We can we can provide you the utility and everything else you need. But without educate you know being able to educate your consumers, or your clients, or your communities, you, you know you're you're going to have some really pretty things living on chain that you're not going to get the interaction with. And and we've got some time there. Yeah, and I think. Look, there's some great tech plays out there at the moment and tools for people. But when you get VC funding, you think about where your plans are aspirationally to exit as a tech company. You don't want to be doing professional services. You don't want to be doing consulting. You want API first tools that yep. people can consume and stand up and SaaS and understand your, you know, multipliers and oh, you're off to the races. So um people are learning that that's really hard at the moment there are very few organizations that are set up to consume that kind of tech and we've had to pivot as a result and think more about okay we've got this team that's now been working with dc comics for over a year and have non-crypto native brand um you know behind the likes of top shop and and Nike artifact, but like DC Comics is pretty, pretty well engaged fair community. Oh, yeah. So right. our team that have learned and gone through that, how can we deploy them to other retailers, sports teams, travel companies? Uh, and it, we're, we're ending up positioning ourselves much more, at least for the next 18 months, as like a managed service mm -hmm. in that space rather than a piece of tech. We'll give you the, the platform as a service, but we want to encourage you to use our people around uh, alongside that as well and, and that's kind of how we're hitting the market at the moment 
Yeah, I'm going to give a really bad analogy, and you can yell at me for it. But but back in Web One, <clears throat> when you know the, the people were first having their first dabble, you know, people had computers. They they understood. You know, they could visit a website here or there. It was still dial up at that in most for most people at that point. Um, back in the you know mid, I, I'd say kind of later '90s, um, and I don't think Web Web Three is is any further than like '93, '94 at this point. So you know, but as we started to get into those first semblances of of uh, you know, web, web one adoption, uh, you remember flash, uh, you're, yeah. you're a little younger than me, but you remember the flashlights and there was zero, like if you wanted one of those and that was the best thing you could do is the most attractive site. You're going to, um, you know, a, a, an internet company and you're asking, you're designing it with them. You're, you're holding, they're holding your hands and walking through how this entire website. <clears throat> and I, I will shamelessly say we, I built many websites that were 100% flash. Um, they were great. They were beautiful. Uh, they're, and now they're gone to, to history except from the way back machine, but that was kind of what you needed to do. Mm-hmm. And, and those people that understood, you know, kind of, Hey, I, it's impossible for me to do this by myself. You could, I could have, um, but the true technical, you know, lifts as well as the interconnectivity that you needed to actually make a working website, um, was not something that was consumerly available. Um, no matter how, you know, forward thinking you were, um, you know, fast forward and, and they figured this out. They ended up finally kind of killing off flash and, and everything else. Mm-hmm. But my point, you know, where I'm, what I'm trying to make here is in early days of an emerging asset class, you have, if you want to have consumer adoption, you're going to have to go to the professionals. Um, there's only so many things that the independent contractors can do. Um, you're, you're going to, you're going to get something that's put up, but it won't be able to be evolved. It won't, you're going to end up with code debt, meaning that you can't have 10 different contractors try to, you know, spin together one massive project. You you know, if DC had done, you know, uh, you know, hey, we're going to do a little on Polygon, we're going to do a little on ETH, we're going to go over Solana, and every one of these was done by a different third party, um, you know, there is no DC universe. It's just, yeah. you know, a bunch of random nonsense that's floating around out there. Yeah, I agree. And it's it's really hard to pick, how do you pick that horse, right, as a brand? Mm-hmm. Um, some people are throwing very generous grants at you to get you up and running. Some people are saying that they won't, take any cash, but they're just benefiting the, in the upside of the project for, for many NFT sales. You know, there's lots of different models out there as well. So one, you've got to try and pick someone that you think's got credibility. We're actually spending a lot of time. I don't know how, I'm trying to think where that fits in the analogy. Maybe you can help me with it, but we're, we're spending a lot of time with existing marketing agencies, so yep. large, the largest that there are out there, you know, holding groups of, of marketing agencies that have set up their own sort of centers of excellence around Web3, because a lot of their clients are asking them. We would much rather try and partner with people that already understand your ecosystem, your objectives, what drives you as a company, what do they know about your, your customers at the moment, rather than try and be that, that expert of everything. And I think... Um, there's probably a bunch of that going on, even when people were getting flash set up, right? So how do yeah, I and, know and, whether it was IBM then or different people that you went to to trust for that kind of setup? Yeah, and, and really back then, and, and again, I, I can, you know, kind of show my age a little bit. <laughs> um, it, w- it was direly important that you wanted to go with the ones that that's all they did. You know, yeah. you, marketing agencies are, are kind of the, the, generally the masters of all meaning that they understand what the, their client, they understand their clients, consumers, and they kind of understand, you know, various go to market strategies for all these other things. You know, you as a, as an NFT studio, um, you know, you, you probably, it's not worth your time to dive into, you know, who's your client base. They're going to tell you that's what they do. And so I, I entirely agree with, instead of the direct to client market, which is what a lot of people do. And that's a lot of the way that, that, you know, a lot of early startups go. Um, but, you know, working with the studios, working with, you know, the agencies, they're the ones that absolutely will tell you, you know, this is what these guys need and this is what they won't, you know, won't tolerate. Yeah. Um, and that's really the, the biggest thing is you want to manage, you know, the client's expectations. You want to be able to produce value for the consumers that are going to be purchasing these things or giving them. Um, and so I entirely agree with like, yeah, work, work with the agencies that already, this is what they do every day. And, and to them, they don't care whether this is a, a billboard in Times Square, um, you know, a TV commercial for the Super Bowl, or they're they're launching a a, a product on the back of a, you know a, a cereal box. Um, they just they they work the flow, and they're thrilled to have somebody that understands the technology, and that they're not going to look stupid when they come back and they go, "Hey, what happened to all those NFTs we deployed last year?" Well, the company went out of business, and it turns out we didn't have the keys, and 
know, they were, they were loaded on some random, you know, Google drive and, you know, sorry. (laughs) No. And in general, I think that those agencies were around before your web one stories, they were around before e-commerce, they were, uh, they're going to be around after web three. So it, it makes sense. And you know, I wouldn't be surprised if more than half of our projects that get launched in 2023 were done a very closely associated with some different agencies. So by far, we think that they're doing a great job of vetting tech. Um, you know, we help introduce certain companies to them that we know of in the space that we think have good product, whether it's building metaverses, digital assets, interoperability of digital assets, dev shops, whoever it would be. I think there's an interest in helping other people in the industry, like accelerate their vetting process so that, you know, companies that are doing it, that we think are doing it the right way, we get associated with. No, I love that. So, so real quick pivoting over to, you know, you guys have a lot more than just NFTs. You guys are actually, uh, you have your own chain, um, that that's running alongside Ethereum and, and, you know, there's a lot of reasons why that's important, but I'd love for you to kind of elaborate on, on, you know, what that is and, and how it operates. Yeah, absolutely. So Dan, who's our CEO, he was head of protocols over at consensus. Mm-hmm. And when he had the idea of setting up Palm, it was really looking at how long Ethereum was going to take to be a true sort of very compliant, friendly chain for NFT specifically. Um, for a web two company to, to start adopting. When you start thinking about digital collectibles and existing organizations that were out there, what can they really access in an, in an easy way for their risk compliance, the way they run businesses today, not getting involved in DeFi, nothing creative, boring old digital collectibles, PR friendly, eco friendly. And he, um, you know, Joe Lubin then is on, is involved as, as a board member of Palm. Uh, he helped, you know, set us up and uh, we stay very close to the Ethereum family. We're board members of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance group. And um, that's, our, that's our sort of like focus is like, how do you make a, a blockchain that, that ticks all the boxes for these large organizations to use? And then obviously we start building our own through, that, so that's the Palm network about 4 million NFTs now on the Palm Network and a number of different projects, some of the more prevalent ones being Major League Baseball, uh, NASCAR through Candy Digital, Nifty's.com, done a lot of projects on using using Palm and then the other main user of it being Palm NFT Studio, which is yep. the area we sit in. Um, we built a number of tools specific to the Palm Network now that organizations can, can come in and sort of replicate some of the sort of approach that we've taken with with uh, Warner and DC Comics and, and Universal Music Group, uh, some of the projects that we've, that we've launched now. Um, the chain itself now sits under a fi- foundation. Hmm. So that was spun out to, to separate in the same sort of like dapper flow type model uh, in 2022. And um, the foundation remains extremely focused on art, which was kind of like through Damien's project was, you know, where we, where we started extremely focused on helping creators, but also being, you know, which we're the driving force behind in the studio being this sort of chain for non crypto native brands that are looking to build large scale fan engagement tools and have aspirations to be a top 20 web three community. It, to me, it's real. I, I love seeing this, this types of innovation happen because, um, you know, right now for all of us kind of, you know, Web3 geeks and, you know, we're so focused on, you know, this chain versus that chain, the smart contract versus like we're, we're really focused mm-hmm. on the technology. But when we get to full adoption, all this has to go into the background. All you know, like so. So now we're arguing, you know, right now we're doing exactly what we should. We're arguing over this is great, but it doesn't work for this use case. So here's another use case. And so to me, where I really see the next, you know, phase is, is the bridges, you know, to me, there's, there's two major problems, a lot of major problems with three, two big ones, uh, bridges and wallets, um, just it doesn't work. And, and, you know, the, the entire, there's some co- core concepts that are just need, need some evolutionary, um, you know, help. And I think that's going to help drive adoption when, the, when those are solved. And I know there's tons of people, including you guys that are working on this, but, but the, but no one, you know, when you visit a website, 
is going, you know, like, is that Amazon S3 or is that Azure? Because I only want to see my websites through Azure, <laughs> you know, and, you know, hey, I, I'm getting ready to make a purchase on this website. Uh, it says Visa, but if it's Stripe that's 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 going through it, you know, I, I really only want PayPal. And, and so there's all these like really kind of <laughs> nuanced fanboy things that, that we're also focused on because we're building this foundation and we're arguing over the things that we should be arguing about. And so entirely, you know, I, I love the thought that it's like, hey, here's a, here, Ethereum's great. We love Ethereum. And, and I thank you for prefacing like, you know, believe me, they'll, they'll still send angry emails anyway. Um, you know, but it's that concept that's like, we love Ethereum, we love what it's doing, but it doesn't work for our use case. And it doesn't work for our, our, our clients, consumers and everyone else, but we're gonna make sure that it's still compatible and, and symbiotic with there. So I, I, I love that that concept. Um, how's it been going really, um, you know, in, in execution? I think, yeah, it's an interesting, uh, like kind of to and fro between areas of the industry and and by the way there's people in our organization from both of these kind of camps but people that you're saying you know we're building this from scratch we shouldn't be looking at having the same challenges that existing tech has like your azure aws example or how come this crm can't talk to this one or you know all, all these kind of challenges and it can feel a bit utopian in in kind of the way that you would want it all to work um and there's a lot of complexities most of the complexities are not necessarily caused by the tech they're called by caused by people's own agendas mm -hmm. in it right and there's there's advantages if you think you've got a, a differentiation in the market of, of maybe not being interoperable with other people and um you know i don't see some of that going away it is useful of having that sort of vision of interoperability that that could solve things that haven't been solved with other tech in the past. Um, I'd add that a lot of clients, at least where their evolution is at the moment of thinking about some of these tools, there's plenty of, of, of our clients that wouldn't want their NFTs to be available on OpenSea. They wouldn't yeah. want, you know, and or, or that's very low down a priority list for them. Um, and they, they're sort of, you know, using this Web3 open technology, public blockchains, but sort of wanting to control a lot of what goes on there as well in their own ecosystem. And um, those two things are, will constantly like play off at each other. And they do in any of our product development discussions in like feedback from client, voice of customer things, in roadmaps that we're putting together. And I'm sure that's going on in other areas of the industry. What I would say for Web3 in, in defense of some of that is the openness of people in other organizations to go and meet with, the amount of people in different DAOs that I would meet with or people that would have potentially uh, competitive products out there. It's a very different spirit of industry, which does give me hope that some of those challenges you you, you were kind of alluding to will, will be solved. Because it's just a, a level of openness that just wasn't there in other companies. Yeah, and, and, and the, the speed of evolution of Web3 is the fastest thing I've ever seen. I mean, it's yeah. like there's a problem and then next week there's 20 different solutions of which now we have, you know, yeah. cause, cause a whole different problem. But it, it's it, the, the speed of innovation, the speed of collaboration is, is unlike anything I've seen. And, and it goes well beyond, you know, Web1, Web2. You know, it's because it's, it's open source. We really yeah. all try, try to go to keep it as transparent. I wonder as if the speed of consolidation this year could like match it as well because you know funding isn't what it was when when we were set up as a as an organization so you've got all these tools great tools out there so much good tech and you've got a mix of people with good with that have got traction people that have got great tech people that have got great people people that have been careful with their funding people that haven't and you know some country companies tick many of those boxes, some tick only one of them. Yep. Like what happens now, because time moves on, right? And that that keeps moving. So I think I think it's really interesting. And I think the openness that people have had in, in the industry anyway means that some of that consolidation could happen in a much smoother way. I, I completely agree. It, need, it needs to happen. You know, to, to me, you need some of the adults in the room. I think there's some amazing developers um, that, that 
quite simply just because the lack of experience, that lack of 10,000 hours have made amazing products and, and amazing innovations that don't have an actual, you know, go to market strategy. Um, but they, but they do combine with many other, you know, many other pieces of technology. And so they can be rolled up. And, you know, I, I want to, my favorite or my most uh, annoyance right now with especially VC in the space um, is, you know, at $50,000 Bitcoin, there was more money than, than they could even find companies to throw it at. Right. Suddenly we're half price. Technology is, is improving and, and evolving. And they're like, eh. But they'll be back at fifty thousand dollar Bitcoin, and and the the valuations will be back where they are. So you know, Why Will Ventures um, is having a field day right now, and so much fun um, because we actually get real valuations. We're getting yeah. great, great pitches of amazing companies that yeah. that two years ago we couldn't have never got onto the cap table, and, and and now it's it's easily possible, and we can make a big difference in in um, you know their 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 career paths. So we we're actually having that conversation yesterday. I was with a couple of guys from the YC DAO, and thinking through like. What ideas are ridiculous right now, but could be amazing when Bitcoin hits 100,000? Like, how do you table those, right? Because you know, it's not going to get anywhere now, but it would absolutely be like really fun to work on, you know, when, when oh, it's more I, flowing around. I, I've got 10 white papers <laughs> and I would love, I would love to debut, but if I, you put them out, you know, right now, it's like, it is like, eh, is that, you know, now, yeah, you, you know, but it. it, it Timing is everything. So, real quick, I want to I want to talk about something that to me is the, the 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 core basis of all Web three, and that's communities. And you guys spend a lot of time on this. So, really, kind of, um, if you don't mind, just kind of talk through your theses of of how you approach communities, how you educate brands that don't understand, you know, what a community is. They may have millions of clients, millions of consumers, but they don't really have a community per se. Yeah, the the it's a it's a really good point, and I have never, you know, I worked in organizations where the idea of getting very controlled voice of customer information back, right? And, you know, here's the top things that our co customer call center were dealing with this, but you know, you're, the, the, pro the process of that that's going through in order to see it, it's just so far away from, and I go back to Porsche just cause it's like very recent, but like everything out there in the open, of what's going on with any conversations about your new product and what people are saying about your product and how you're responding about your product. And I think people really, have, you can never really be fully prepared for that, I think, in sort of the Web2 companies that we're dealing with. But you can try and prepare them and the ways to try and prepare them are, first of all, to get them into communities, right? Like Y Wales, Jump Community is one, it's good, right? There's another others that are just, one, they're aiding your uh, learning about the space. But two, you're seeing how you are treated as a member of the community, what access you have for different people, um, speed of response, that organizations expected speed of response as well that organizations have, how quickly new ideas come up and new kind of experiences or products can be launched and also how quickly they can be shut down without needing a lot of justification. I think all of these mechanics are really interesting for, for people to learn and you can learn by being involved in them um, and participating in them. And I think how much communities are driving products is a real eye opener for a lot of these Web2 brands. It's really, That's fabulous. really interesting to see. So describe if you would, let's, let's just, uh, you know, pick, pick a dream company that you'd love, um, you know, out, out of thin air and just kind of walk through the entire, you know, from pitch, uh, on to onboarding to deployment process that, that you guys over at Palm go through. Sure. So let me pick one that I would, yeah, that I am not actually speaking to, but maybe they'll hear this and we'll end up speaking. Right. But, uh, I think a lot about retailers of brands at the moment. And I'll give an example of one that, that we're not speaking to, but would like to is like Foot Locker. Okay. So I might buy all my sneakers at Foot Locker today. For my family, they might have a reward program that means I get perks, get discounts, get early access to certain products. And there's got a whole MarTech stack against that, right? Yep. And there's two things going on. One is people are now buying digital shoes, right? That are mostly artifact, but like the, it's starting to be a thing that you would buy sneakers for your avatar to wear in a game. 
whether people can get their head around it yet or not, and what size demographic of Foot Locker can, can do that or not is up for debate, but it is happening. And they go to uh, NFT marketplaces to do that, that invest a fraction of the resources and money and time that someone like Foot Locker would into customer experience. It's just because that's where they are in it. No knock on OpenSea, but someone like a Sephora, a Foot Locker, a Saks Fifth Avenue, uh, just concentrating more on customer experience than, than you are at OpenSea. So how can they improve that for these customers? And if I was a Foot Locker reward customer today and I go to OpenSea to buy artifact shoes, why don't, I probably would prefer to buy them in Foot Locker or on a Foot Locker site. And what could I even get some pretty cool in real life experience in the store of buying them as well? And, and how, you know, where's the space here for me? One, to reach a new demographic of people that are a new kind of sneakerhead. And two, to just make sure that my current customers, that I work hard to give them this experience, that I'm able to like tra transmit that into a new, into a new product line. You know, I love that example because I've got a 15 year old who's suddenly into sneakers yeah. and, and it's a, and it's a concept I don't understand. <laughs> um, they're, they're shoes you're going to wear out or out of them. I understand, uh, you know, lots of other things, you know, watches and whatnot, but he's, he's super into these and, yeah. um, you know, there's after, after, you know, birthdays and Christmases and everything else, like there's only so many pairs that I, I will buy a, a 15 year old of, yeah. of shoes, especially when he's still growing and he doesn't have a job. And so they've, they've resorted to like all the kids in the school, they're buying the knockoffs. And, you know, that is that that's detrimental to the brand. That's, you know, yep. kind of, you know, it, it escapes the ecosystem per se. Um, but but there's no way for anyone that they look at and they go, yeah, it's close enough. It's fine. The, the concept of having, you know, a digital twin um, that is that is sold and, and sits alongside of all those the, the valid sneakers, you know, something that's more than just the hologram that, that's on the label and everything else, something that actually says, you know, and, and is locked to. Um, the, this pair of sneakers is absolutely viable and will be a, a, a standard in the future. I have no no doubt whatsoever that, that that's coming. Yeah, there's a there's a good market opportunity for for these teams, and they and that's a good example as well of like, sure you could launch your own NFT as well, or you could just like build a really good marketplace for people buying other things. Like Foot Lock, I don't buy Foot Locker shoes today, right? So how do you transfer? what's made you successful in your in your web two world to to this new one and i mentioned then like people like saxon sephora that are probably thinking through this exact thing as well it's the same it's the same game that they're in and they and they win at it today so how do they win in this metaverse web three nft space with it too and, and, you know, it's, when I hear that, it's for any executives watching or, or marketing executives and people trying to say this, an NFT is more than checking a box. <clears throat> and I think that's the biggest part that, that I'd love for you to expand on a little bit, Ali, is you can deploy an NFT, no problem. There's lots of people that can do it. It's, you know, you can call, you can call Palm, you can call, you know, a hundred other people, you can go on Fiverr and you get somebody that will deploy an NFT. Mm -hmm. It's everything that has to happen before that during that and after that, that really makes the difference of, did you deploy an asset that will have any long-term value or did you just, you know, go ahead and check a box and say, yeah, we deployed NFTs. It didn't work. We don't care. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. And I think we we're having a conversation earlier today with, with our product team, the real hard work starts after launch, as I'm sure, you know, people that have launched recently find out you do all this work in launch, you do like some activations or get some, PR and all those different things. That's you sure you need to do that and listen to your community and launch. But the amount of work that goes in now, you know, we launch weekly comics with DC. So if you are a holder of a premium DC NFT, a back cow, you get early access to these drops. But we only drop somewhere between three and five thousand of these comics a week. They tend to sell out in ten minutes. Yeah. They tend to have. 10x that amount of people in queue to, to buy them. We sell them for $10 and then they have a secondary market where some of them have sold into the thousands. But the amount of work that goes in on DC side as well, not just ours, into that of new experiences, what do you allow people to do with the, where can they trade them? Um, 
what are even tech support thing what are you doing for fraud control each week we're having to change things that go on and to get in this kind of like run rate of where we've got the dc community now took a long time to get there and if we would have stopped um you know there are a number of when we did our when we did our first drop with dc which was over half a million nfts in a few days it was december two years just over just over a year ago um you know there are other other projects that launched at that time too and just didn't go on and do much afterwards i think as well as the tech part of the nft and the utility and the fact it can gate access to things is, is one part but it's the people side of it that's still super heavy and there aren't that many people that understand that at the moment unfortunately yeah no and it goes back to the one of the points i said originally it's an nft is a key <clears throat> you know yep. what does it unlock and what does it do you know that's i think that's the way that i've had most success explaining to some people yeah and you know and and i like the point that you make it doesn't matter what the brand is, you know, it's uh, DC comics is a, a massive brand. They have, you know, huge, huge adoption and, and followings. Um, but if they didn't do the NFT, you know, if they weren't doing it correctly, no one would care. And I can point to GM who's had a horrible time. I mean, literally one of the worst NFT rollouts that you could have because nobody will even touch them. Like they can't even sell. Like, I think they want to sell like one NFT and like still no one bought it. Like it expired and they just said, well, never mind. We're not doing this anymore because there was no value. You're going to buy a $120,000 car for a $250,000, but you get a $250,000 NFT to get a car that costs half the price. That's, there's no value and that doesn't really bring community. I was so excited else. just given they were called GM as well. I thought it was like, this, this has got to be, there's so many things you could be doing. Oh my God. I go, I go, this is gonna. I said, they're rolling out NFTs and then they rolled out one. <laughs> And it didn't sell and it had no value. You know, or it had value, but it was it was yeah. already you were underwater in a car. Just I've seen to- other ones that, you know, have done small drops. Chicago Bulls did a small drop. Um and, and collaborate with some artists to like reimagine their logo. It was great. Like did twenty twenty or something like that, one of ones. That's yeah. really fun, right? That that's kind of thinking and showing that you're not you're open to you know, create a manipulation of your assets and things like that. And, you know, hopefully that, that they kick on now moving forward in, in other ways. But um, yeah, it's just some of it. It's, it's a little tick to tick a box. You can tell, you can tell when they're ticking a box. hundred percent, hundred percent. Ali, this has been, you know, just an amazing conversation. And I, the, the few things I'm taking away from this um, is, is number one, it, this is a lot of work. This is, you know, like any other major uh, brand that if you're going to launch a product, you're going to do a marketing campaign, you're going to do, you know, anything, you know, you have to really think about why you're doing it, how you're going to do it, and then what you're going to do with it after it launches, because these, these live forever. Um, what are just kind of your thoughts um, for businesses, entrepreneurs uh, that are in the space that are thinking about, you know, really kind of expanding their market or their consumers into digital collectibles, NFTs, and all that fun stuff? Yeah. First of all, people that have launched in this space already, whether it was deemed success or failure, I think, that, and, and you know, you are a web two brand. I think you deserve a lot of kudos. You don't, especially if you're a large market share company and don't need to be a first mover in this. I think it's great that you've given that a go. And especially the ones that have been extremely thoughtful about how they've approached it. So First of all, kudos to those brands that have so far. And um, and just equip yourselves with people around that you think are there for the right reason. If someone's just around you for a rev share, if someone's just around you for the launch of a project and you've got no plans to engage with them afterwards as a vendor, just think about that. Think about um, what kind of roles do you really need internally and to get things done? versus externally how can you how can you lean on organizations like us to to train some of your people internally on on some of this tooling so that you're not just getting things deployed but you're leaving there better understanding the tech from your team you don't need a large team to launch an nft project but you do need to have the right resources around you that you can tap into a lot of our clients use probably a day's worth of an analytics uh, lead a week. You don't need your own analytics person in Web3, but you do need to have access to someone that can give you what you need, you know, finger on the pulse of what's happening with industry trends. So just make sure that you're getting 
those from the people you're working with and you have the right organization or structure and agreements with them. You wouldn't launch an, a CRM without wheeling out a bunch of essential consultants or something. So like when you're thinking about this control, like take it seriously and make sure that you've got the right people around. I love that. That's fabulous. Um, Ali, if people want to learn more, engage uh, Palm or, or just kind of chat with you, where's the best places to find you guys? I am on Discord uh, in certain groups, but also uh, Oliver Jones on LinkedIn, palm.io. You can find our team as well. Feel free to reach out. Uh, yeah, I'd be excited just to speak with anyone uh, about this stuff. And I'm, I'm in New York. So if people are in New York, I much prefer person if we can do it. So <laughs> I'm a Zoom guy myself. That being said, uh, Y Whales, this is Ollie with uh, Palm NFT Studio. And, and again, really excited for uh, the collaborations that, that Y Whales and Palm are working on right yeah. now. Um, we, we both kind of share visions for where this is going, but we also understand how early in this asset class uh, really everything is. So it's a great time for innovation. It's a great time for invention and, and just exploration. So I appreciate uh, you know the time today. Yeah. Uh, y Whales, we'll catch you next time. Thanks. Thanks, Jay.